Listening to a gardening program the other day, I was struck by something the expert said about a particular type of potted plant. Do not water it once it has come into bed. He advised, cause it to feel stress and it will produce more and more beautiful flowers. Surely, this advice is against everything that we were told by doctors. Stress is bad for us, they say. Stress is the cause of all sorts of diseases. Stress caused by overwork sometimes results in early death. Newspaper and magazine articles tell us how to reduce stress or how to avoid it altogether. No one has a good word for stress. And yet, I asked myself if stress is good for plants, can there possibly be any value for us in it? The longer I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that there is. Without a certain degree of tension and stress, we are apt to become lazy and neglect our duties. All students know that they should study regularly throughout the year and then be able to face examinations without fear. In fact, most students leave this study till the last possible moment and then hastily try to make up for lost time. Many of us, likewise, put off dealing with our problems until the deadline approaches. Every year I resolve that I will write all my Christmas cards and letters ahead of time and avoid a last minute rush. And every year I find that once again I have left it too late for me to finish comfortably. Only when the tension increases, do I start working seriously to get the job done? In other fields too, when satisfaction enters in, creativity and curiosity go out of the window. What has been called divine discontent, a creative dissatisfaction with the present situation, whatever it is, produces progress. And that dissatisfaction is one type of stress. Thus, it seemed to me a certain degree of stress is necessary for human progress. Just how much is good and how much is harmful is the problem. Those of us who are employed by a company whose policies demand long periods of stressful activity are to be sympathized with. Since too much stress is counterproductive. Those of us who are self-employed may have more freedom to choose our own best level of stress. In either case, we need some preparation before the period of stress in order to be able to succeed. So, like the potted plant in question, if we are watered sufficiently to begin with, and then left to struggle for a while on our own, we too may produce more and better flowers than one who, overprotected, has never had to try. In 1800, a stuffed animal arrived in England from the newly discovered continent of Australia. The continent had already been the source of plants and animals never seen before. But this one was ridiculous. It was nearly two feet long and had four covered skin. It also had a flat rubble-like bill, a piece of skin between its toes, a broad flat tail, and a spur on each hind leg that was clearly intended to produce poison. What's more, under the tail was a single opening. Zoologists started at the thing in disbelief. Hair like a mammal, bill and feet like an aquatic or a water bird, poison spurs like a snake, a single opening in the rear as though it laid eggs. There was an explosion of anger. The thing was a joke. Some unfunny joker in Australia 
taking advantage of the distance and strangeness of the continent, had stitched together parts of widely different creatures and was intent on making fools of innocent zoologists in England. Yet, the skin seemed to fit together. There were no signs of artificial joining. Was it or was it not a fake? And if it wasn't fake, was it a mammal with reptilian characteristics or a reptile with mammalian characteristics or was it partly barred or what? The discussion went on heatedly for decades. Even the name emphasized the way in which it didn't seem like a mammal despite its hair. One early name was Platypus anatinus, which is Latin for flat foot duck like. Unfortunately, the term platypus had already been applied to a type of beetle and there could be no duplication in scientific names. It therefore received another name. Ornithorhynchus paradoxus, which means bird beak paradoxical. Slowly, however, zoologists had to reach agreement and admit that the creature was real and not a fake. However, upsetting it might be to zoologist notions. For one thing, there were increasingly reliable reports from people in Australia. Who caught glimpses of the creature alive. The paradoxus was dropped and the scientific name is now Ornithorhynchus anatonus. To the general public, however, it is a duckbill platypus, or even just a duckbill. The curest mammal, assuming it is a mammal, in the world. When specimens were received in such condition, as to make it possible to study the internal organs. It appeared that the heart was just like those of mammals and not at all like those of reptiles. The egg forming machinery in the female, however, was not at all like that of mammals, but like that of birds or reptiles. It seemed really and truly to be an egg layer. It wasn't until 1884, however, that the actual eggs laid by creature with hair were found. They were not the eggs of platypus, but another Australian species, the spiny anteater. That was worth an exciting announcement. A group of British scientists were meeting in Montreal at the time, and the egg discoverer. W. H. Coldwell sent them a message to announce the finding. It wasn't until the 20th century that the intimate life of duckbill came to be known. It is an aquatic animal living in Australian fresh water at a wide variety of temperatures, from tropical streams at sea level to cold lakes at an elevation of a mile. From 1950 to 1980, the so called Green Revolution swept the world. World food production doubled with the introduction of a new approach to agriculture. It involved the large scale cultivation of new types of grain wheat, corn, and rice, and an extensive use of chemicals and farm machinery. These ideas were the cause of the early enormous success of this revolution. However, the Green Revolution methods no longer appear to be so successful. Though the population continues to grow, food production has failed to keep up with it. There are a number of reasons for this. One reason lies in the expense of the new farming method. The new kinds of grain produce much more than traditional grains, but only under certain conditions. In order to get maximum production, farmers must use large amounts of expensive chemical fertilizers. They also need to use expensive chemical insecticides since the new grains are more easily damaged by insects. Expensive watering systems are also necessary for these grains. 
especially in drier areas. Many farmers cannot afford to buy all the chemicals and equipment. Soil erosion is another reason for the lower grain production. The large scale farming of a single crop creates the perfect conditions for erosion. In dry areas, especially, the loss of topsoil has lowered the productivity of the land. In these areas, also grain production has been limited by lack of water. The new type of grain requires much more water than the grain people used to grow. Yet, another reason for lower production lies in the nature of the chemicals that farmers have used. Though these fertilizers and insecticides raise production levels at first, they must be used in increasing amounts after that. Many farmers cannot afford to buy more, and so production decreases. These chemicals have other effects that are expensive in the long run. They flow into the groundwater, causing pollution and health problems. As people learn about these problems, they put pressure on farmers to further limit their use of chemicals. Finally, the Green Revolution has brought about social and political conflict that has interfered with food production. The problem lies in the cost of the new agricultural methods. Only the larger landowners can afford to make the necessary investments for maximum production of the new grains. With their profits, the large landowners then buy land from the smaller farmers. This way, the large landowners become ever richer and the number of landless poor people increases. Social tensions naturally increase in this situation. Clearly, it is time to question the methods of the Green Revolution. Governments and farmers need to look at the overall picture and long term effect. They need to find new methods that will better meet the needs of the world's hungry people and that will also be less harmful. It's interesting how much email affects our personal space. While some businesses have replaced much inner office phone communication with email, most users see email as a medium that protects their private space far more than the telephone. Email gives us a freedom to communicate on our own terms. It's possible for us to communicate without allowing anyone to hear our voice or see our face. While email offers personal privacy, it also enables us to start a conversation with people we aren't acquainted with. We send emails to people we would rarely telephone or request to see face to face. Of course, the people we send messages to have the option to respond at their own convenience, or not at all. There's a growing tendency to make email addresses, but not phone numbers, public. This practice is a result of the increasing acceptance of email as a form of direct contact. Even with well known people, we usually couldn't approach in person. If there is no voice to hear and no face to see, many email users become very open about the information they are willing to reveal online. The lack of visual and auditory signals. Greatly increases the amount of information speakers are willing to let others know about themselves. People write things in emails they will not want to say in a face to face conversation or on the telephone. An important point is the degree of exposure a person perceives. Investigators in one study demonstrated that even seeing yourself reduces your sense of privacy. In the experiment, Participants were asked to comment either on intimate or non intimate topics while sitting alone in one of two rooms and speaking into a microphone. One room had bare walls, the other contained a large mirror. When discussing intimate topics, participants in the mirrored room were less likely to enjoy the task, had the longest times before answering questions get the shortest answers and gave less intimate information than those who couldn't see themselves. 
Thus, the more we keep our personal details private, the more likely we are to speak our minds. Email, as we know, it allows a high degree of privacy, which in turn helps generate more openness. There are continuing reports from parents about email communication with their children who have left home for college. Sons and daughters who had little to say to their parents while still in high school, who even now rarely write or phone home, commonly email just to chat. Similarly, research on the role of computers has shown that people offer more accurate and complete information about themselves when answering questions using a computer than when answering the same questions on paper or through a face-to-face -face interview. The differences were especially noticeable when the information at issue was personally sensitive. Until recently, Kavalam, a small fishing village in India's Kerala state, could not keep up with its rising popularity. Attracted by clean beaches, friendly people, and a relaxed way of life, visitors from as far away as Europe began coming in large numbers to the region in the mid-1960s. Over the next two decades, investors rushed in to meet the demand building row upon row of new hotels, restaurants, and souvenir shops. But in 1993, the tourist trend began to slow. By 2000, the number of tourists had decreased by 40%. Travel experts ruled out economic factors and shifting tourist tastes. Finally, explain the decline as one caused by the community's waste management problems. Like many popular destinations in the developing world, Kavalam has no formal plan to deal with the growing levels of garbage generated by tourists. Hotels and other facilities collect recyclable items such as glass, paper, and metal scraps for reuse by local industries whenever possible. The less desirable items, plastic bottles and even uneaten food, for example, simply pile up in towering mounds or are dumped into nearby streams, posing the risk of serious disease. Yet, a local politician complained, nobody bothers about the health issues faced by people. Everybody wants Kavalan Beach to be clean just so it can get more business. These problems are not unique to Kavalan. Increasingly, developing countries are turning to tourism as a way to diversify their economies, stimulate investments, and create earnings. Tourism is one of the world's least regulated industries. This has implications for communities and cultures around the world. Hotels, tourist transport, and related activities consume huge amounts of energy, water, and other resources and they produce pollution, often in destinations that are unprepared to deal with these impacts. In addition, many communities face cultural troubles and other unwelcome changes that accompany higher visitor numbers. Fears of terrorism and the safety of air travel may have lessened interest in some international travel for the time being. However, over the long term, the demand for tourism is expected to resume its steady rise. Many government industry groups and others are promoting responsible travel that makes money and creates jobs while also protecting the local environments and cultures. While it does succeed in some circumstances, this kind of environmental responsible tourism can produce many of the same problems as ordinary tourism including the creation of waste. In some cases, it is little more than a marketing tool for businesses hoping to promote an environmentally conscious image. As tourism's impacts, both good and bad, continue to spread, it is more and more important to redirect activities onto a path 
that protect local resources to the fullest. This will require deep changes that reach far beyond the scope of responsible tourism. A broad range of people and organizations, including executives at large companies, government, non governmental groups, and the tourists themselves, will need to become involved with the efforts to protect and maintain at all levels. The environment and culture of the various places to which tourists go. How often do we say, of course I believe it, I saw it with my own eyes. But can we really be so sure what it is that our eyes tell us? For example, take the simple question, how big is the moon? Could any of us make a good estimate of the moon's size if we had not read what astronomers tell us about its diameter? What does looking at the moon or any other object tell us about its real size? What do we mean by real size or real shape or other appearance for that matter? Can we believe what we see of things or rather putting it the other way around? What do we mean when we say we believe that a thing has a certain size or shape? The brain interprets the image on the retina in the light of all sorts of other information it receives. Perception, in fact, is by no means a simple recording of the details of the world seen outside. It is a selection of those features with which we are familiar. What it amounts to is that we do not so much believe what we see as see what we believe. Seeing is an activity not only for our eyes, but of the brain, which works as a sort of selecting machine. Out of all the images presented to it, it chooses for recognition those that fit most closely with the world learned by past experience. I want to give a few more examples to show how what the brain has learned influences a process we call seeing things. Seeing, they say, is believing, but is it? An arrangement can be made in such a way that a person looks through a peephole into a bare corridor, so bare that it gives no clues about distance. If you now show him a piece of white paper in the corridor and ask how large it is, his reply will be influenced by any suggestion you make as to what the piece of paper may be. If you tell him that the particular piece of paper is a business card, he will say that it is quite near. Show him the piece of paper at the same distance and tell him that it is a large envelope, and he will say that it is farther away. On the other hand, if you show a very large playing card, say a queen of spades, he will say that it is very close. And if you show a tiny one, he will say it is a long way away. Because you see, playing cards are nearly always of the standard size. In fact, the size of things we perceive depends upon what we otherwise know about them. When we see a car from far away, its image on the retina is no bigger than that of a toy seen near. But we take the surroundings into consideration and gives its proper size. If Yusuf K. Hamiyat came down with a grave illness requiring expensive medical treatment, he could afford it. Hamiyat controls the third largest pharmaceutical company in India and owns acres of invaluable real estate in Bombay. God has been kind, he says. But for millions of people, the opposite is the case. And 19 months ago, Hamiyat did something remarkable for them. At a European Commission medical meeting in Brussels, he expressed the conviction that no company should be allowed in oligopoly on life-saving drugs and then proceeded to destroy one of the most outrageous of them, all by offering to sell anti-AIDS drugs at a small percentage of the going price. As a result, developing countries are starting to get the drug cocktail that has saved thousands of lives.
We have an epidemic on our hands, insists Hamiet. How can you justify selling something that costs $200 for $10,000? What Hamiet did was to cut through the selfish arguments of Western drug companies that put shareholders' interests before the lives of millions. Indian pharmaceutical companies, including Hamiet's Sipla, have an advantage. It's legal in India to copy a medicine designed abroad and put it on the local market, as long as the companies can prove they use a different manufacturing process. But they can't export to countries with stricter patent laws. When Hamiet went to Brussels in 2000, a year's treatment with AIDS cocktail cost a patent $10,000 to $12,000. Western countries holding the patients insisted they had to earn back their original research and development expenses. Hamiet said it was time the victims got treatment regardless of the patent issues and offered to sell his cocktail for $800 to $10,000 per year. A few weeks later, he lowered the price to $600 for government purchases. Today, Thailand and Brazil have begun manufacturing and selling the AIDS cocktail. Last month, CIPLA won World Health Organization approval to market the AIDS drug wherever local governments agree to allow its sale. Hamiet is proof you can do well by doing good. The anti AIDS cocktail he sells sustains lives while helping maintain his own high standard of living. Hamiet, who earned his doctorate in chemistry from the University of Cambridge, considers the AIDS battle part of a border campaign to maintain India's loose patent regime. India's patent laws are supposed to meet World Trade Organization standards if the country ratifies the WTO's Intellectual Property Treaty. Hamiet says that could make his people very helpless. Against p r o f i t e r i n g drug companies, and India has an estimated 4 million HIV positive cases. Hamid has the fight of his life ahead on his own turf. Comment が嬉しかったので、急遽作ってます。Okay. There is a large amount of evidence which shows that people believe words to have magic powers. This is most easily illustrated with those very special words, people's names. In the traditions of modern Ethiopia, the real name of a child is concealed to prevent the child from being influenced magically through the use of the name. It is believed that knowledge of the name gives power over the person who bears that name. Beliefs of this type are widespread throughout the world. In Borneo, for example, the name of a sickly child is traditionally changed so that the spirits tormenting it will be deceived and leave the child alone. The spirits, apparently, can recognize people only by their names, not through other characteristics. An extreme example was reported by the early explorers in the Marquesas Islands. There, it was possible for two people to exchange names as a sign of mutual respect. But this exchange of names also involved an exchange of responsibilities, obligations concerning the family, friends, and even enemies went with the change of name. A man might even be expected to go to war because of the responsibility to his new name. In some cultures, the use of a particular name is an offense. In Imperial China, for instance, it was a crime to use the name of a reigning emperor. This could provide problems when the emperor's name was also a common word. If this occurred in an English speaking country today, where the emperor's name was Bill, it would be illegal to talk about a bill. From the electricity company, a bill before a parliament, or the bill of a bird. Similar prohibitions are found among the Zulus. There, 
A woman is not allowed to utter the name of her husband or the names of his parents. Similar kinds of constraints can apply to the names of things, as well as to the names of people. It is fairly common to find a taboo against the use of the name of a powerful animal, such as a bear, tiger, or crocodile. Instead, phrases like honey eater or nicknames like brain are used. In parts of Africa and India, it is not acceptable to call snake a snake. Instead, You say things like, there's a trap or there's a rope. It is believed that if you call something a snake, it is likely to act like a snake and bite you. In a similar way, barbarian farmers in Germany traditionally do not call a fox a fox, in case using the word brings the fox and causes it to attack their hands. In a very similar way, we still say, talk of devil. Suggesting that speaking of someone causing them to appear. Finally, and more subtly, it used to be the case in China that a doctor who d o not have the appropriate drug for his patient would write the name of the drug on a piece of paper, burn it, and get the patient to eat the ashes. It was believed that the name of the drug would be just as effective as the drug itself. David Greybeard first showed me how fuzzy the distinction between animals and humans can be. Forty years ago, I befriended David, a chimpanzee, during my first field trip to Gombe in Tanzania. One day, I offered him a nut in my open palm. He looked directly into my eyes, took the nut out of my hand, and dropped it. At the same moment, he gently squeezed my hand as if to say, I don't want it, but I understand your motives. Since chimpanzees are thought to be psychologically close to humans, researchers use them as test subjects for new drugs and vaccines. In the labs, these very sociable creatures often live isolated from one another in five by five foot cages. Where they grow bad tempered and sometimes violent. Dogs, cats, and rats are also kept in poor conditions and subjected to painful procedures. Many people will find it hard to sympathize with rats, but dogs and cats are part of our lives. 10 or 15 years ago, when the use of animals in medical testing was first brought to my attention, I decided to visit the labs myself. Many people working there have forced themselves to believe that animal testing is the only way forward for medical research. Once we accept that animals are capable of feeling, is it ethical to use them in research? From the point of view of the animals, it is quite simply wrong. From our standpoint, it seems ridiculous to equal a rat with a human being. If we clearly and honestly believe that using animals in research will, in the end, reduce massive human suffering, yet, it will be difficult to argue that doing so is unethical. How do we find a way out of this dilemma? One thing we can do is change our way of thinking. We can begin by questioning the assumption. That animals are essential to medical research. Scientists have concluded that chimpanzees are not useful for AIDS research because, even though their genetic makeup differs from ours by about 1%, their immune systems deal much differently with the AIDS virus. Many scientists test drugs and vaccines on animals simply because they are required to, by law, rather than out of scientific merit. This is a shame because our medical technology is beginning to provide alternatives. We can perform many tests on cell and tissue cultures without needing to harm animals. Computer simulations can also cut down the number of animal tests we need to run. We aren't exploring these alternatives vigorously enough. 10 or 15 years ago, 
animal rights activists reported to violence against humans in their efforts to break through the public's terrible indifference and lack of imagination on this issue. This extremism is counterproductive. I believe that more and more people are becoming aware that to use animals thoughtlessly, without any anguish or making an effort to find another way, diminishes us as human beings. It is worth looking at one or two aspects of the way a mother behaves towards her baby. The usual fondling, cuddling, and cleaning require a little comment. But the position in which she holds the baby against her body when resting is rather revealing. Careful American studies have disclosed that 80% of mothers cradle their infants in their left arms, holding them against the left side of their bodies. If asked to explain the significance of this preference, most people reply that it is obviously due to the fact that more mothers are right-handed. By holding the babies in their left arms, the mothers keep their dominant arm free for manipulations. But a detailed analysis shows that this is not the case. True, there is a slight difference between right-handed and left-handed females, but not enough to provide an adequate explanation. It emerges that 83% of right-handed mothers hold the baby on the left side, but then so do 78% of left-handed mothers. In other words, only 22% of the left-handed mothers have their dominant hands free for actions. Clearly, there must be another less obvious explanation. The only other clue comes from the fact that the heart is on the left side of that mother's body. Could it be the sound of her, her heartbeat is the vital factor? And in what way? Thinking along these lines, it was argued that perhaps during its existence inside the body of the mother, the groaning embryo becomes fixated on the sound of the heartbeat. If this is so, then the rediscovery of this familiar sound after birth might have the calming effect on the infant, especially as it has been thrust in a strange and frighteningly new world outside. If this is so, then the mother, either instinctively or unconsciously, will soon arrive at the discovery that her baby is more at peace if held on the left against her heart than on the right. This may sound strange, but tests have been now carried out which reveal that it is nevertheless the true explanation. Groups of newborn babies in a hospital nursery were exposed for a considerable time to the recorded sound of a heartbeat at a standard rate of 72 beats per minute. There were nine babies in each group, and it was found that one or more of them was crying for 60% of the time when the sound was not switched on but the disfigure fell to only 38% when the heartbeat recording was thumping away. The heartbeat groups also showed a greater weight gain than the others, although the amount of food taken was the same in both cases. Clearly, the beatless groups were burning out a lot more energy as a result of vigorous actions of their crying. Humans have long conceived conflicting sentiments about sleep. We want it, enjoy it, and despair when we can't get enough of it. Yet, we also have a fear of getting too much. Napoleon recommended six hours of sleep each night for a man, seven for a woman, and eight for a fool. Why do we need sleep, and how much of it should we get? Scientists are beginning to answer the questions and believe that humans sleep for different reasons than other animals. In experiments, mice have been shown to suffer physically from lack of sleep. After a few days, they begin to lose weight, although they eat a lot. After 14 days, they die. 
Humans, on the other hand, usually show few physical problems from lack of sleep. A bad night's sleep will cause little reduction in strength, coordination, or stamina. Yet, cognitive function suffers sharply. Our vocabulary drops measurably. We are unable to concentrate for long periods. Our speech may become unclear. Why the difference between humans and other animals? Scientists reason that humans have learned to rest their bodies in an awakened state. The difference in metabolic rate between a person lying down and one who is asleep may be as little as 5%. Yet, our brains, it seems, very much need the rest that sleep provides. The recommended amount of sleep has been disputed in recent years. Humans have strange sleep patterns, usually getting 6 to 8 hours a night during the working week and up to 10 on weekends. Why is it that most of us want more sleep if we can get it? American researchers now argue that humans need a minimum of 9 hours sleep each night. These scientists theorize that we are deprived of sleep most of the time. As proof, they cite the drowsiness most of us feel at some point during the day. European researchers challenge this notion, asserting that there is such a thing as sleep gluttony. The fact that we like sleep does not mean we need it. Studies support the European view. If people are given the opportunity to sleep longer, for instance, they may not feel tired until a later hour the next day. The extra hour in bed may do nothing more than adjust our daily rhythm. Experts say that drowsiness many of us feel during the day may not be because we had too little sleep at night, but because we need an early afternoon nap. Humans were made to sleep not once, but twice, and a 10-minute nap after lunch will make most of us feel better. This is the reason so many cultures keep the siesta hour. Don't look at the world with your hands in your pocket. Mark Twain once told an aspiring young author. To write about it, you have to reach out and touch it. I thought of this advice when I visited Robert Burnett, former executive director of the American Foundation for the Blind. Burnett was blinded at the age of 14 in an accident. As we chatted, he noticed, I don't know how, that I was gazing at a life-size bronze head of Helen Keller, which he keeps near his desk. Feel it with your hands, he told me. I ran my fingers over the cool metal. Now, does it look any different? Bernard asked. The difference was surprising. The sculpture now had weight, depth, shape, and character which had escaped my eyes. Touch is more than a substitute for vision, Bernard said. It reveals qualities other senses can't even suggest. One of the greatest mistakes people make is thinking you have to be blind to enjoy it. Learning to develop the sense of touch is something like making your other senses secondary. In seeing with the eyes alone, we are limited to what is immediately in front of us. Touch along with vision enables us to see something as a whole. Awareness of touch can bring a new feeling to the most commonplace experiences. I have just touched my dog, wrote the young Helen Keller in her diary. He was rolling on the grass with pleasure in every muscle and limb. I wanted to catch a picture of him in my fingers, and I touched him lightly as with cow whips. But to my surprise, his body turned towards me and moved into the sitting position and his tongue gave my hand a lick. He pressed close to me as if he intended to put himself into my hand. He lapped in it, with his tail, with his paw, with his tongue. If he could speak, I believe he will say with me that paradise is attained by touch. 
the sense of touch is capable of extraordinary development. Expert millers can recognize any grade of flower by rubbing a little between thumb and forefinger. A cloth expert can identify the coloring used in the cloth by the difference it makes in the texture. The blind botanist John Grimshaw Wilkinson learned to distinguish more than 5,000 species of plants by touching them lightly with his tongue. We are aware today of how important touch is to complete understanding of anything. And there are now museums that instead of old don't touch signs, offer children the chance to touch, to feel the roundness of the sculpture, the beautiful balance of an Inca picture, and the rough iron of an early New England kettle. Visitors to the Brooklyn Children's Museum are encouraged to pick up and handle the object on display in every exhibit. If they can't touch the things, says Mike Kalm, the museum's senior instructor of anthropology, it is no different from watching a movie or TV show. Maybe as we all aim to enlarge the range of our impressions, our motto should be do touch. All of us, almost daily, experience the mobility of our world. We could be in Tibet tomorrow, and not only our bodies, but also our minds are traveling at the speed of light. Global communications have made us all virtual neighbors and taught us tolerance. Two generations ago, there were no roads in Nepal. Now, the information superhighway and English language paths run through the tea houses of the Himalayas. Yet, even as we enjoy the opportunities of the borderless economy and the varieties of world music and our ability to appreciate the cultures of the world in our living rooms, we fail sometimes to consider where we are going or what we might be losing. To be rooted, wrote the philosopher Simon Weil, is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. And in our dawning age of rootlessness, we tend to speed into the future without counting the bends in the road. One problem, of course, is that everything is happening so quickly. Five years ago is Asian history now. And yesterday, scarcely, prepares us for today. We have no previous examples to guide us. The classical poets Homer and Virgil sang of travelers, but not once crossing 11 time zone before noon. And nomads have always traveled across the earth, but on foot and in tune with the rhythm of the seasons and tradition. A new age of mobility means a new age of homesickness, and that is for those of us lucky enough to have a home. All of us are time travelers now, able to fly in less than a day from the 21st century, downtown Tokyo for example, to the 13th Bhutan where customs, houses and customs are maintained in strict medieval style. Tonight, we can fly into the depth of the opposite season or into the arms of a family we haven't seen for 20 years. And the shrinking of distances in space may blind us to the more significant distances that remain. Flying from Beirut to Beijing to Bogota on succeed days and finding the same services in each we may underestimate the differences in values and assumptions. The truths of the village square do not extend across the global village. Thus, traveling today can be like watching TV, channels surfing through a mass of images too fast to read and too various to sort. And traveling tomorrow, for those of us without a firm sense of neighborhood or community or home, 
may involve an even stronger sense of spiritual confusion. Our values, like our bodies, may be up in the air or lost in space. The only thing that can support the burden of our movement, after all, is a steadying sense of stillness. Though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, we must carry it with us or we find it not, wrote the philosopher Emerson. He considered travel a fool's paradise. The same is even truer of our sense of destination or home. Whatever we find when we travel is only what we've had inside us all along. We know that the two cerebral hemispheres of the brain have different cognitive capacities. This can lead to asymmetries in behavior and in the way in which we interpret the world. Many studies suggest that the right hemisphere of the brain is more involved in the perception of emotion and in its expression than the left hemisphere of the brain. In relation to language, the right hemisphere of the brain is better at interpreting the emotional tone of voice in speech. A typical experiment illustrates this. It uses some sentences with a happy message like, she won a prize, or the sun is shining. Other sentences are less cheerful. He lost all his money gambling, or it is raining very heavily. And yet, other sentences are neutral with no particular emotional content. They are read in different tones of voice, which are either consistent with the sentence's message or in opposition to it. Although, in principle, to lose money gambling is unpleasant. If it had happened to a great enemy, it might nevertheless induce some sensation of pleasure. And it is possible to read the sentence, He lost all his money gambling, in a cheerful tone of voice. Similarly, some Californians have an unusual enthusiasm for rain, and it is possible to read the sentence, it is cold and rainy in a cheerful tone of voice. Subject or ask to categorize the emotional content of the sentence, both in terms of the message that is conveyed and the tone of voice. Two sentences are presented at the same moment. One played to the right ear and one played to the left ear in a listening setup. Since the connections that the left ear makes with the right hemisphere are stronger than the connections the right ear makes with the right hemisphere, any bias towards superior judgments from the left ear is taken as evidence of increased right hemisphere involvement in the task. In this kind of experiment, the left ear is better at making judgments about the tone of voice, whereas the right ear is better at judging verbal content. Brain-damaged patients who have sustained injuries to the right hemisphere have difficulty in making such interpretations of emotional mood from speech. Their language and communicative systems appear relatively normal in terms of being able to say roughly what they want to say. But the content of their speech is often emotionally flat, lacking its previous variation and modulation is sounding rather dull. In fact, it is suggested that the more creative elements in language are absent. Some of the connotative associations of language may be influenced by the right hemisphere. One of the most remarkable stories I know is about a man called Robertson McQuilkin. As a young man, he dreamed of becoming the president of Columbia Bible College in Columbia, South Carolina. He adored his father, who had held this position, and he hoped to take his father's place someday. Robertson McQuilkin's dream came true. One day, he did become the president of the Columbia Bible College. When he became the president, 
He was convinced that he was called by God and was worthy of that position. Dr. McWilkin served as president of the college for a number of years, and he did very well and was respected and loved by many people. Then, one day, this man realized he had a tragedy on his hands. His wife began to show the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. She became worse in a short time, and in a matter of months, she was in a terrible situation. She not only lost her memory of much of their life together, but she was unable to even recognize him. She lost all awareness that he was her husband. Robertson McQuilkin made his decision. He resigned the presidency of the college so he could give full-time care to his wife. Without hesitation, he walked away from his job as an act of love for her. There were some realists who told him there was no meaning in what he was doing. Anybody could take care of his poor wife, they told him, but not anybody could be president of the college. And after all, she didn't even recognize him when he came in the room to help her. Then there were some religious people who said he was walking away from what God called him to do. He was letting his personal concern for his wife interfere with his more important social responsibility, they said. The men's answers were magnificent. To the realist, he admitted that his wife didn't know who he is, but that wasn't important, he told them. The really important thing was that he still knew who she was, and furthermore, he let them know that he recognized in her now forgetful self the same lovely woman he had married those many years ago. Then. He turned to the religious people. His words to them were even more profound. There is only one thing more important than your job, and that is a promise. And I promise to be there for until death do us apart. Live simply so that others may simply live. Perhaps you have seen these words on a bumper sticker, or maybe you have heard someone speak them aloud. These words are the essence of living sustainably. It may seem that to have a sustainable lifestyle, you will have to change your life completely. Yet, this is not true. You can begin to create a sustainable lifestyle very easily. You can choose a simpler lifestyle by reducing your energy and material consumption. Probably one of the easiest ways to reduce your energy consumption is to recycle. The amount of energy saved by recycling one glass bottle will light a 100 watt light bulb for four hours. Not only does recycling save energy because new bottles need not be manufactured, but it also saves natural resources and reduces the amount of garbage that must be carried and dumped into landfills. You can recycle many materials, including glass, moss plastics, cardboard, white paper, newspaper, aluminum cans, tin cans, grocery bags, and magazines. Many cities have organized curbside pickup for recycling. If this program does not exist in your area, you can take your recyclable materials to recycling centers. Buying products made from recycled materials is as important as recycling waste. Some products made from recycled waste include writing paper, greeting cards, packaging materials, tissue boxes, and plastic containers. By choosing products made from recycled materials, You've completed the recycling cycle. Sustainable living also includes your choice for mode of transportation. Choose to take public transportation, ride a bike or a carpool as your main method of transportation. 
Now is the time to develop an environmentally conscious approach to transportation that may establish a lifelong pattern. Alternative transportation will not only save energy, but it will also reduce the amount of pollution released into the atmosphere and relieve traffic congestion. The food you choose to eat can also reduce energy use and material impact on the environment. If you choose to eat foods that are lower on the food chain, you decrease the energy cost of producing the foods. You may decide to eat less meat or to eat more foods grown organically. You probably cannot immediately implement most of the steps outlined above. However, this you can do right now. Look around the area where you are currently sitting. Notice how much energy is being wasted on lights or other appliances that may be running needlessly. What can you do about it? Remember to turn off electrical appliances and lights that are not in use. Starting about 1 million years ago, there was an increase in the growth of the human brain. It expanded at first at the rate of one cubic inch every 100,000 years. Then the growth rate doubled. It doubled again. And finally, it doubled once more. 500,000 years ago, the rate of growth hit its peak. At that time, the brain was expanding at a rate of 10 cubic inches every 100,000 years. No other organ in the history of life is known to have grown as fast. What pressures generated the explosive growth of the human brain? A change of climate that set in about 2 million years ago may supply part of the answer. At that time, the world began to enter into a great ice age. The first on the planet in hundreds of millions of years. The trend toward colder weather set in slowly at first, but after a million years, areas of ice began to form in the north. They thickened into glaciers as more snow fell, and then the glaciers joined together into great sheets of ice, as much as two miles thick. When the ice sheets reached their maximum extent, they covered two-thirds of the North American continent, all of Britain and a large part of Europe. Many mountain ranges were buried entirely. So much water was locked up on the land in the form of ice that the level of the Earth's oceans dropped by 300 feet. These events occurred precisely at the same time as the period of most rapid expansion of the human brain. Is this significant or is it accidental? The movements of humans in the last million years provide a clue to the answer. At the beginning of the Ice Age, humans lived near the equator, where the climate was mild and present. Later, they moved northward. From their birthplace in Africa, they moved up across Arabia and then turned to the north and west into Europe, as well as eastward into Asia. When these early movements took place, the ice still only covered the lands in the far north. But 800,000 years ago, the ice moved southward until it covered large part of Europe and Asia. Then, for the first time, humans encountered the bone-chilling freezing winds from the cakes of ice in the north. The climate in southern Europe had a Siberian coldness then, and summers were nearly as cold as European winters are today. In those difficult times, resourcefulness and inventiveness must be in of great value. Which individual first thought of stripping the far from dead animals to wrap around his body? 
Only by such inventive, imaginative acts could human beings survive a cold climate. In every generation, the individuals with strength, courage, and creativity were the ones more likely to survive the Ice Age. Those who were less resourceful fell victim to the climate and their numbers were reduced. The Ice Age winter was the greatest challenge that human had ever faced. They were naked and defenseless against the cold, as some little mammals had been defenseless against the dinosaurs 100 million before. Facing the pressures of the hostile world, both those mammals and humans were forced to live by their wits, and both became, in their time, the most intelligent animals of the day. The rapid shrinking of the Arctic ice cap is threatening the world's polar bear population. Scientists have warned. Studies suggest the decline in the thickness and extent of the ice cap is causing the deaths of hundreds of bears a year. The total polar bear population is estimated at only 25,000. Many spend long periods trapped on land where they find it hard to feed rather than on ice, while young bears are dying in dens that melt and collapse. Research by Dr. Peter Wadhams shows that the summer ice now averages just 9 feet in thickness compared with 16 feet 20 years ago. He predicts that all the polar ice will disappear during the summer months by about 2080. However, the bears will suffer disastrous declines long before them. Around Hudson Bay in Canada, the increase in warmth has forced bears onto land when the ice melts from July to October. In recent years, however, the return of the ice has been delayed by up to a month, leaving dozens of underweight and hungry bears roaming on the beaches waiting for its return. The animals cannot easily find food on land, so every day spent waiting means that they consume more fat reserves. Scott Shuley said huge changes in the biology of the Arctic were apparent. The pack ice is already diminishing every summer and without pack ice, I cannot see how the bears would survive. They are not adapted for living on land, he said. The bears live almost entirely on floating ice that packs together to create vast expanses separated by small areas of open water that they swim across. They are superbly adapted for survival in the frozen north, eating mainly seals. They range across a huge area of ice controlled by Russia, America, Canada, Greenland, and Norway. Adult males reach weights of 1,005 pounds and are among the fiercest and most dangerous of animals. Bears have long been hunted by humans for meat and fur. The numbers to be destroyed are now strictly controlled by international agreements, but hundreds are still killed each year. Humans also present another threat to bears. Thorough pollution of the sea with poisonous chemicals called PCBs, which accumulate in fat. The huge layers of the fat used by bears to survive in the cold collect PCBs, which then affect their hormonal systems and can cause sex changes. Scientists say that warming of the Arctic is largely due to rising global temperatures. The direct effect is to melt the ice from above, but the indirect effect is even more destructive. Wadham's research shows that the Gulf Stream and other currents that carry warm water north have become stronger, warming water beneath the ice cap to melt it from below too. Another effect of the melting ice would be to open up the shipping routes between Europe northern Russia and the Far East 
and to end the annual winter isolation of Siberia. In the next few years, we are going to see the opening up of the Arctic Ocean to year round traffic, said Wadhams. Eventually, the Northwest Passage around Canada may open up too. It will completely alter our trading patterns, but for bears, the future could be dark. Communication is the means by which people create their identity. It analyzes our sense of community, our sense of belonging, and our sense of difference. As patterns of communication change, so do the communities with which we identify. The printing press brought about a revolution in the spread of ideas and information. A more far reaching revolution in communication came about at the end of the 19th century with the arrival of electricity and the first experiment in electric means of communication. This was the beginning of the information revolution. The possibility of communication as both global and internet at the same time. Although this possibility is inherent in the new technologies, it is far from a reality for most of the world's population. There are more telephones in Tokyo than in the whole of Sub Saharan Africa. Television is a mass media only in the most developed countries. Computers and the internet are not accessible to most of the world's poor. The information revolution had led to combining of the world's banking services, commodity markets, data systems, and capital flows, but has widened the division between the information haves and the information have nots. Only one electric communication medium has become both an intimate and widespread presence throughout the developed world and penetrated into the remotest rural areas of the poorest countries. That, of course, is radio. Bruce Girard has described the Latin American environment as a radiophonic salad. Upstate, private, church, university, special interest, and native people's radio stations. He describes a rapid increase in the use of radio by popular groups over the past 20 years. There are radio stations from a peace and organizations and women's groups, and there are radio stations run by the Catholic Church or by labor unions, such as those of the Bolivian Dame Miners. From these groups across the continent, radio programs have emerged would describe themselves as educational but are outside and unconcerned with the structures of formal education. Native people, for example, have their own radio stations which take account of local languages and traditions. Next to spoken language itself, radio is the easiest medium to use for learning and teaching. It is the most worldwide medium available and is cheap and straightforward to set up. It potentially offers a bridge between the vast knowledge resources available through the internet and the millions of people who have access to no other means of electric communication. Community radio groups are already exploiting this opportunity through internet-based news and information services such as the Latin American radio news agency Pulsar. An inclusive, more equal and more democratic society requires an inclusive and more open communications environment, which together we can call a communicative democracy. One element in the communicated democracy must be popular and open access to the media of mass appeal. And radio is the most suitable medium. Language, 
serves many functions. Certainly, one of its most common and most important purposes is to help us describe various phenomena, such as events, situations, and people. What is it? Another purpose is to evaluate these same phenomena. Is it good or bad? Typically, we consider descriptions to be objective, whereas we consider evaluations to be subjective. But is the distinction between objective description and subjective evaluation a clear one? The answer, in the vast majority of cases, is no. Why? Because words both describe and evaluate. When we attempt to describe something or someone, the words we use almost always carry values. In that, they reflect our own personal likes and dislikes. Thus, our use of any particular term serves not only to describe, but also to assert what is desirable or undesirable to us. This problem is not so prevalent in the physical sciences as compared to the social sciences. Let's take as an illustration the term cold and hot. In the field of physical sciences, both terms refer, in a relatively neutral sense, to the rate of molecular vibrations or temperature. The liquid is very cold or the liquid is very hot. When we use these same terms to describe an individual, however, they take on a distinctly evaluate meaning. The person is very cold or the person is very hot. What are the consequences of the evaluate bias of language? The words that we use can, with or without intention, become powerful instruments of change. In those instances, where we are deliberately attempting to influence others to agree with our own point of view, we intentionally select words that most persuasively communicate our values. In many cases, however, the process is unintentional. Our best attempts to remain neutral are restricted by the limits of language. When it comes to describing people, it is nearly impossible to find words that are empty of evaluating meaning. Incredible as it may seem, we simply don't have neutral adjectives to describe personality characteristics. And even if such words did exist, we still would be very likely to utilize the ones that reflect our own personal preferences. This also emphasizes the neutral influence of attitudes and language. That is, not only do our attitudes and perceptions affect our use of language, but our use of language, in turn, influences our attitudes and perceptions. Because of the evaluative bias of language, we must be careful both to become aware of our own personal values and to communicate these values as openly and fairly as possible. In other words, we should avoid presenting our value judgment as objective reflection of truth. We should also be alert to the value judgments inherent in other people's use of language. And in many cases, the words they use tell us at least as much about them as about the events and individuals they are attempting to describe. 